Uh, good afternoon, uh, members of the Atlantic Menhaden Management Board, and greetings from sunny but cold and windy coastal Georgia, at least cold by our, our normal standards. Uh, this is Spud Woodward, your chair, and I'm going to call our, our meeting to order. Our first item of business is we have a draft agenda for consideration. Are there any uh, requested modifications or changes to the agenda? If so, raise your hand so you can be identified. You have Allison Colden. All right, go ahead, Allison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, if possible, I'd like to request just a couple minutes under today's other business section to uh, bring an idea to the board about next steps related to improving our Menhaden data and modeling. Very good. I think we'll, uh, we'll have time for that. Thank you, Allison. It's uh, duly noted. So any other uh, recommended or requested changes to the agenda? Uh, if not, uh, any opposition to adopting the agenda? I don't see any hands raised. All right, and we will uh, adopt the agenda by consent. Next item of business will be approval of the draft proceedings from our October 2020 meeting. Are there any edits, uh, modifications, changes to the proceedings as presented in the materials? I don't see any hands raised. All right. Any opposition to adopting the proceedings as presented? No opposition. All right, we'll consider the proceedings adopted by consent. Next, we have public comment. Uh, if there are members of the public that would like to make comment about the activities of the Atlantic Menhaden Management Board, please raise your hand so you can be identified. And once we determine how many folks we have that want to comment, I'll, uh, we'll make a decision about allocated time. What are we looking like, Tony? Um, I believe we had two hands raised, Bill and Tom Lilly. Tom Lilly put his hand down, so, but I think he he indicated to Kirby he wanted to speak, so. Okay, two. very good. All right, well, we'll start with, with Phil Zelsack. Uh, Phil, uh, you've got uh, three minutes, uh, and uh, we'll let you know when uh, you get to the end of those three minutes, so you can go right ahead. All right, thank you, Chairman. Uh, the most important issue facing the board is the overharvesting of Atlantic Menhaden in the Chesapeake Bay by the reduction fishery. Why? This board lowered the total allowable catch for Atlantic Menhaden by 10% from 216,000 metric tons to a little over 192,000 metric tons to improve the survivability of striped bass, bluefish, and weak fish. Since the commission allocates over 78% of the total to Virginia, and Virginia allocates over 90% to the reduction fishery. The reduction fishery is allocated over 136,000 metric tons or 71% of the total allowable catch of the entire Atlantic coast. Of this total, 51,000 metric tons can be harvested from the Virginia portion of the Chesapeake Bay. 51,000 metric tons is 26.5% of the Atlantic coast total allowable catch. Clearly, overharvesting of a men Atlantic Menhaden is occurring in the Chesapeake Bay. It gets worse. Omega protein frequently positions its boats just outside the entrance of the Chesapeake Bay so they can harvest migrating Menhaden entering and exiting the bay. So what's the impact? The devastating decline in the commercial harvest continues in the Chesapeake Bay for important predator fish such as striped bass, bluefish, and weak fish. In the last 22 years, the commercial harvest has declined 34%, 76%, and 98% respectively. The devastating decline in commercial fishermen continues in Maryland and Virginia. In the last 20 years, Maryland and Virginia have lost a combined total of 668 commercial fishermen. That was a 32% decline for Maryland and a 40% decline for Virginia. So does, does, so does this affect your state? 60% or more of the ocean-going striped bass originate as spawn in the Chesapeake Bay and its tributaries. And the GDP associated with striped bass recreational fishing industry alone amounts to $7.7 .7 billion and over 104,000 jobs as reported in the 2019 Striped Bass Fishery Management Report. Clearly, this is impacting your state business base along with Maryland, Virginia. 
I therefore propose the following addendum to the current fishery management plan in the form of motion, which does not take one fish from Omega Proteins quota. It reads as follows. The Atlantic Menhaden reduction fishery is limited to the, ocean, the Atlantic Ocean outside the three nautical mile exclusive economic zone. Any board member can make this proposal as a motion and start the process for review. Atlantic Menhaden need to recover for the benefit of recreational fishermen, non-reduction commercial fishermen, and last but not least, the marine environment. Start the process and give this issue the light of day for the public. Finally, the data just pre pre presented comes from the commission or state documentation. See my email of noon today. I thank you for your time and consideration. Take care and be safe. Thank you, Phil. Uh, appreciate your, your comments. All right, uh, Tom Lilly, are you, uh, you ready to make your comments? Yes, I am, Spud. All right, go right ahead. Uh I'd like to take a, can I have an extra minute just to reminisce a little bit since I'm an aged person and I might know a few things that might be important. Can I have okay. an extra minute? We'll, we'll, let, we'll let you have an extra minute, okay. so go ahead. Okay, great. Listen, uh, as you all know, I've been involved in this quite a while and I've gotten the chance to talk to, to quite a few of you. And I want to say I personally that I appreciate so much taking the time if you've looked at our, our new website you know completely the direction we'd like to see this board go but I would like to reminisce with you a little bit because you know I found it so difficult to work with some of the managers because they just haven't seen the Chesapeake Bay the way we knew it say 15 or 20 years ago uh, yeah, you can describe it, you can write it down on paper, you can take pictures, but those are just words on paper and ink on paper. They don't, in any way, it's so hard to convey that feeling of what it's like out there and how important these Menhaden are uh, to the way we live on the water. Uh, so I wanna tell you a little quick story. Uh, about 15 years ago, I live in Whitehaven. It's a cold December day, the snow was blowing a little bit. I have a, a 26 foot world cat, me and some friends loaded up and headed down toward Tangier Sound. Uh, it was getting colder, the snow was blowing. I got a little bit of canvas on the boat. But uh, anyway, I got out in the mid river around 72, Bowie 72, which is not that far above the Virginia line. And looking down toward Tangier, Virginia, it's an amazing sight. You can see, eh. A hundred boats, a hundred charter boats, a hundred, uh, you know, many small boats looking up toward Cambridge Way up north, hundreds and hundreds of uh, large charter boats and smaller uh, boats with guys like us, and huge schools of Menhaden. And I mean, these are schools and eh, the size of, uh, you know, a stadium with gannets working them, noisy birds. Uh, captains maneuvering around these schools, uh, planer boards out, uh, 30 lines in the water, crowds of fishermen back in the cockpit. Some of these are big boats. They hold, you know, 12 fishermen. Most of them are six-pack boats, but guys in the back of the cockpit just waiting. And those lines are out and bang, four lines go down. The mates are running around. They're <laughs> they're trying to get all these lines in there, fish tangled in the lines. It's it's just a Chinese cluster, you know what? It's just amazing. And fishermen start cranking and they're pulling in these beautiful fat rock fish and it's just an incredible sight. And these guys are having the time of their lives, these fishermen. It's an experience they're never going to forget. Uh, there were probably 150,000 charter clients taken out that winter. So you just have to be there to, to enjoy it and, and, and to want it to come back. That's the important thing. We want that back again for our uh, kids and our grandchildren. Uh, so 
that's a little that's a little bit of the reminiscing uh and i'm trying to go through uh what we're after here what we're trying to have you pay attention to i know a, a lot of it's been in the website and i hope you've looked at it but uh yeah tom, tom let me let me sorry to interrupt you really need to get you yeah. just to wrap it up if you would uh, if you're just gonna if you're gonna repeat what phil said i, I think we got it no i'm not, not repeating not, anything of what phil said what i want to talk need, about is the what I want to talk about is, is Chesapeake Bay's Menhaden Forage Base being rebuilt? And that's the bait, that's the Menhaden coming in May and June. It takes a, a lot of Menhaden to, re, to rebuild Chesapeake Bay's forage base, probably about 30,000 tons. There are 12 200-foot persaners after those fish. And the question I am trying so di diligently to have you all consider is does some protection need to be given to those Menhaden, those few Menhaden schools that are coming in in May and June that we need to rebuild the forage base? You know, if the forage base was being rebuilt adequately, if it had been the last 10 years, we would not have all the problems that our bay is experiencing and has experienced if there were adequate fish there. You know the list of problems, they're right in Bob Beale's letter. He spells every one of them out. Uh, malnourished rockfish, microbacteriosis, sharp declines in all the commercial catches, 50% declines in the watermen. Uh, I'm sure you've read Dr. Brian Watts's letter on, on ospreys. Ospreys are dying out in the main bay because they're not getting menhaden. They're dying out in front of my house. Uh, so we're just asking the delegates to, we're very, very proud of the delegates that have uh, indicated that this is a discussion that will be going on in the future about protecting this, this forage base. Uh, there are very simple ways to do that. Let me give you one example. Okay. All right, Tom, Tom go ahead. I'm going to give you about 30 seconds. And, and we're going okay, to have to great. Come thank, on. thank you. Uh, they take about 30,000 tons of Menhaden in, in, June, in May and June. Okay, that's about the amount the forage base needs is, is taken away. Now, all you would have to do is have omega protein just fish north of Cape Charles out in the ocean begin it for the first 60 days of that season. That means the fish migrating, they would then be catching from the schools that have already passed Chesapeake Bay. And that flow of school, uh, Menhaden from the Carolinas would get into the bay for first time in decades, and it wouldn't interfere with their business at all. It would change Chesapeake Bay completely. That could all be right, done uh, so uh, simple. We're going to, we're That's right. what we're asking. Tom, we're going to need... Okay. But thank we, you. We thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you, you all Raymond stay safe. Thank, thank you much. All right. Thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, um, Ed, another hand yeah. went up. Uh, Pat Moran put his hand up during when Phil was talking. Another okay. Moment. All right, um, Mr. Moran, you'll, you have three minutes as well, so go ahead. Don't hear anything. Tony? Trying to find them again. Okay. Sorry. I don't see him on the webinar now. Okay. Well let, let's let's move along. Yep. yep. Okay. All right. Uh, before we get into our, our next agenda item, I just want to make a few clarifying comments about where we are. Um, amendment three requires the board to review the allocations established in that amendment uh, every three years. So we are uh, in the, the, the fourth year after uh, the implementation of those allocations. They started in fishing year 2018. So we, uh, we are bound to review the allocations this year. However, it's important to note that the amendment does not specify what constitutes the review. It is uh, up to the board to decide what is uh, a review and to conduct the review that's satisfactory to the 
for the board members. So what we're doing today is, is the beginning of that process and Kirby and others have compiled information about performance of the fishery. Uh, however, we do not have the information for fishing year 2020. We will not have that information until April uh, and it would not be available for this board to, to consider until the May meeting. So that's just sort of a cautionary word uh, in terms of when we start having discussions uh, in reaction to what Kirby's producing that well, we do have time. If there is the desire on the part of this board to start a management action to change the allocations, um, that can be done in May and we would have adequate time to have that action completed in effect for the 2022 fishing year. Uh, also, just as a little reminder that you know, we're fishing this year under a different tack, uh, and we'll be fishing under that same tack next year. Uh, so that may have some bearing on um, how we interpret the information uh, that's available to us. So with that uh, preface, I'll turn it over to you, Kirby. Great. Thank you, Chair Woodward. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, Excellent. All right, so I have a uh, brief presentation. I'm going to go through to review recent fishery performance relative to commercial allocations, and then I'll take questions. Uh, next slide. So first, some background to help frame the, the next few slides on landings and quota transfers. Amendment 3, approved in 2017 and implemented in 2018, established the current quote allocations to manage the total allowable catch attack is what we refer to it as. Each jurisdiction is allocated a 0.5% um, or 0 0.0 or excuse me, 0.5% uh, fixed minimum quota. And the remainder of the attack is allocated based on a three-year average of landings from 2009 to 2011. Annually, jurisdictions have the option to relinquish their fixed minimum quota by December 1st of the preceding fishing year. Any quota relinquished by a jurisdiction is redistributed to other jurisdictions that have not relinquished their quota based on landings data from 2009 through 2011. And any overage of quota allocation is determined based on final allocations. So that's inclusive of quota transfers. And the overage amount is subtracted for that jurisdiction's quota allocation in the subsequent year on a pound for pound basis. So today I have three tables I'll present, two of which are in the memo included in supplemental materials. So back in the fall, we received a request for the following information. The first was each jurisdiction's landings as a percentage of the annual coastwide total and quota transfers. For pulling this data together, we use total landings, which it's important to note includes directed bait, reduction landings, as well as incidental catch and landings occurring under the episodic set-aside program. So what's on the screen now is table one from that memo. So looking at this table, it's important to understand that total landings data used to display a state's percentage of the coastwide total encompasses more than a jurisdiction is allocated in a given year uh, due to quota transfers, episodic landings, and or incidental catch. So Maine is a good example of this. In 2018 and 2019, Maine was the only state to opt into the episodic set-aside program and landed 4.6 and 4.4 million pounds respectively. Similarly, for 2019, Maine was the only state that declared incidental catch landings, which totaled 10.7 million pounds. So again, annual landing percentage is higher than what you're seeing as their amendment three allocations in the table do not indicate a quota overage. Since the implementation of the amendment, the TAC has not been exceeded, and that's inclusive of incidental catch and episodic landings. Um, also important to note, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, and Georgia's information have been removed from the table to protect confidentiality. Uh, last, I'll, I'll just point out that the ESSA program um, has been in place since 2013, and landings under this program have changed uh, quite a bit in terms of volume and then distribution um, across the coast in terms of which states are participating uh, 
um, between 2013 and 2019. Uh, the next table I have on the screen, next slide, um, shows how jurisdictions have performed with only their directed landings relative to their annual quota, which accounts for both redistributed relinquished quota as well as quota transfers. So a few points to take away from this slide. No jurisdiction exceeded their directed fishery quota in either 2018 or 2019. Most jurisdictions varied in landings compared to their quota for both years, but some were consistent. So Florida and North Carolina landed less than 30% and 20% of their respective quotas in both years. Maryland consistently landed just over 40% of their quota and only three states landed 90% or more of their quota for both years, Massachusetts, New Jersey, and Virginia. Um, again, this table is not in the memo, um, but moving on to the next slide, this is table two from the memo, um, and here we have the quota transfers from 2018 through 2020. Not every jurisdiction transferred quota consistently during these three years. Uh, only Maine, Connecticut, New York, Maryland, and Florida either gave or received quota every year uh, during this time period. And those uh, are bolded in the far right column. For all three years, the only jurisdictions that have a net increase in their quota through transfers were Maine, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts. So in 2018, a total of 5.4 million pounds of quota were transferred. In 2019, a total of uh, 100 or 11.25 million pounds were transferred, which is obviously an increase from 2018 levels. And in 2020, 10.6 million pounds were transferred. Next slide. So to wrap up, uh, this presentation and the memo um, were provided as background information for the board's consideration as part of reviewing allocations in Amendment 3. You know, this is an initial first step. The board can request additional landings data moving forward. As Spud noted, um, preliminary 2020 landings will be available uh, later this spring through state compliance reports. And last, uh, just a, a, a note that, you know, when looking across different types of landings that we have in this fishery, confidentiality may pose an issue in trying to uh, fully display uh, a state's information um, over a certain time period. So that may present um, challenges in trying to fully understand how every state in each landing category performed. But with that, I'll take any questions. So thank you. Thank you, Kirby. So I'm going to open it up for questions. So if you'll uh, raise your hand and we'll, uh, we'll work through the list of, of folks that have questions. So Tony, I'll look to you. Uh, give me a heads up here. Yep, uh, you have so far two people on the list, John Clark and Megan Ware. All right, go ahead, John. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Kirby. Uh, you mentioned relinquishment of quota, but it, or the, the TAC, Kirby, but it didn't show up in the table and uh, just think it would help people understand more how much uh, of the tax states are giving up if they could see how much was relinquished. Because I know for Delaware, it looked like we didn't do much transferring and we certainly don't catch anywhere near our, our uh, tax, but we do relinquish most of our tax every year. And, you know, that would be something that might be helpful in seeing how the, uh, the tax is given up by different states. Thanks. Thanks, John. I have that noted. Appreciate it. Thank you, John. Go ahead, Kirby. I just said I have that noted. Uh, I'll appreciate it. Okay. All right, Megan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just have a clarifying question on the second table that Kirby presented. Um, I just want to understand that is um, percent of, I guess, total quota that a state ends up with at the end of the year. So that would include transfers in the denominator. Is that correct? correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. 
All right. Any other questions for Kirby? I have no hands raised, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, any general comments about uh, the fishery performance that uh, board members would like to make uh, to help inform this discussion? You know, like I said earlier, you know, we don't have the 2020 information. Uh, we certainly don't have to do anything today other than uh, absorb this information, uh, provide guidance uh, to Kirby uh, about what else we may need uh, in the future. Uh, but I'll certainly, uh, we've got time, so I'll open it up if there are some, some general comments that people would like to make. We have Ms. Ware and Ms. Madsen. All right, go ahead, Megan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I appreciate you kind of outlining the timing on this conversation because I do think we're quite early in the process and there's some important information coming in May. Um, my intent today is really just to signal that Maine is interested in a conversation about Manhattan allocation. Um, and if it's okay, Mr. Chair, if I could take maybe a few minutes to just talk about the main fishery and some of the challenges we've been facing. Um, I think kind yes. of, to, thank you. <laughs> um, go, go right ahead, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't think this is a surprise to anyone, but you know, over the last five years, we've seen really an exponential increase in the volume of Manhattan in our state waters. And I think concurrent with this, we've seen a shift in the timing of when Manhattan arrives. So they're showing up earlier and earlier in Maine. And then they're also moving further and further east in Maine. So kind of closer and closer to Canada each year. Um, and the result of this is that our quota first just doesn't match the resource in our area. But certainly as the Manhattan show up earlier and they go up further up the coast, the quota we do have gets used earlier and earlier each year. Um, and really the result of this, which is I think pretty well born in Kirby's tables, is that Maine is 100% reliant on episodic and quota transfers in the small scale fishery. Um, I think the memo shows that at this point we land about 5% of the quota and we're allocated 0.5% of the quota. Um, obviously this has pretty big implications for the management program that we use in the state. And we've tried very hard to stay within the bounds of the FMP and um, have moved to implement measures that are significantly more conservative than what's in the FMP to just stay within our quotas. Um, so we have implemented daily electronic reporting um, so we can effectively monitor this fishery. Um, we seem to implement increasingly strict trip limits each year. So originally we were at 120,000 pounds. Um, last year we ended up at 6,000 pounds on July 2nd, and we stayed at that for the, the remainder of the year. So basically most of our Menhaden fishery was at 6,000 pounds. And we applied that trip limit to transfer quota um, as a way to kind of help slow the use of that quota since it was so early in the year. Um, We've also kind of borrowed some management measures from Herring. So we have days out for Manhattan and Maine. Um, you know, we didn't used to have that. Last year, we ended up, I think, at two landing days. And then I think tied with all of that is a high priority on enforcement that we've tried to put in the state, just given this is a rapidly changing fishery. Um, and to kind of help focus the conversation, I guess there's three challenges that I would highlight that Maine is facing. Uh, the first one's pretty clear. It's just that we have essentially more Menhaden than quota allocated. And since the fish are showing up earlier each year, this means we run through our quota quicker and we enter the small scale fishery earlier. Um, and that's not a position I completely love. Um, we have become completely reliant on quota transfers. And I, I do want to take this opportunity to thank all the states for their generous quota transfers. Uh, Every time we call on July 4th weekend, I'm really appreciative that people pick up the phone. Um, but I will say it's near impossible to manage a fishery when we get quota transfers at different amounts and at different times. And I think probably other states can empathize with this, but it just makes it impossible to plan out a season 
And the result is we're always reactive to what quota we have in the piggy bank as, as opposed to proactive. Um, and I think the third challenge, and this is somewhat created through Amendment 3. I actually think Amendment 3 was trying to be helpful in creating these different pockets of quota. So we have the episodic quota, um, we have transferred quota, we have access to small scale fishery. Um, but the problem is that each of these kind of comes with a different set of characteristics or regulations. And we're just moving through these different phases of the fishery so quickly that it causes uh, some pretty big management challenges. Um, we're just constantly changing regulations and, and so that system isn't working too great. Um, so again, just trying to signal that Maine is interested in a conversation on allocation. I don't think that's a surprise to anyone. Um, I don't have any motions today because I do think we're quite early in this conversation, but if there are ways we can help advance those conversations between now and May, whether that be through additional data requests or just conversations amongst ourselves, uh, we would be supportive of that. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. J just for the for the members that may not be as knowledgeable about uh, the, the fishery in Maine, um, the, the Menhaden landings that are occurring, uh, so what, are, what sort of the proportional use of those landings? Um, you know, in terms of wh where is it going? I think that might help some of our other. Our other. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, it's 100% for bait. We don't have a reduction fishery in Maine. Um, so 100% of this is bait, and I would say, com probably confidently say it's all going to the lobster fishery. Um, it has become quite an important bait source. Um, I think there's some unique characteristics in Maine. So we, we do kind of have two different sets of participants in the Menhaden fishery. We have, I think what most people would think of, which are your larger vessels that are part of the bait infrastructure uh, in a state um, and commercially sell that for bait. Um, but we also have a group of smaller vessels, which tend to be lobster vessels that want to go and catch bait for their own use. Um, so we kind of have these two distinct populations that have somewhat different um, goals of what they would like to see in the fishery, but it is all going as bait to the lobster fishery. All right, thank you. Uh, before I go to Shannon, does anybody have any uh, questions for, for Megan? Uh, any Anything that you think uh, Maine could provide that might help us um, in future uh, you know, activities related to the review of the allocations? If so, now would be a good time to, to speak up so that Kirby can capture that. Mr. Chair, you have several people that have ha put their hand up since uh, asking for comment, and I don't know if these are direct questions to Megan or just folks that want to comment, but we have Lynn Fagley, Dennis Abbott, Roy Miller, and Cherie Patterson. Okay. Okay, well, I'll tell you, we'll just proceed with the questions, and if any of these are related back to Megan, then we'll, we'll just handle that as we go. So, uh, uh, Shanna Matson, I think you're next in the queue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and if we do want to go back to having folks comment on um, Megan's comments, I'm, I'm happy to let them go in front because mine is sort of unrelated. Um, and it's sort of about the data streams that are coming into some of these conversations. So I don't know if you'd like to take that now or, or wait. Yeah, just go ahead. We can, we can always bounce back to, to okay. Megan if we need to. Just go ahead. Great. Um, so my comment is sort of related to, um, I think some of the data streams that I saw both go into the projections as well as the allocations. Um, I guess my question is sort of generally more uh, towards where are our data sources going to come from when we're having these allocation discussions? Um, I know that several states um, in the past have had some issues rec uh, reconciling their landings data internally at the state level to the ACCSP data warehouse. Um, and kind of looking between the compliance reports and their data warehouse to try to get those two numbers to line up in a meaningful 
um, fashion. Um, and so for me, from my standpoint, I think it's really important to decide where our data streams are going to come from when we're talking about allocations. Um, and so I don't know if that's more of a question directed towards staff um, in that, you know, I, I know that it takes a really long time to get these data validated and ready to come before the board, but I personally think it's really important to be using validated landing data versus um, some of the compliance reports. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering if we continue this conversation, if there's a signaling of if we'll continue to use compliance report data or if we'll be using um, validated landing data. Okay, good question. And I'm gonna I'm gonna pass that one to Kirby and maybe even Tony for a response. Sure. Thanks, Chair. Um, I I can speak to what we used in the memo, um, and yeah, it, it's a it's a good point uh, to to bring up. So we we use the data that we get from uh, state compliance reports. Um, so you know, at least some caveats with that data that I think the board should be aware of is you know so that's what each state submits to us. Um, you know, when compliance reports are due later in the spring, uh, that data is is inherently preliminary. We know that we treat it as such, and so um, the the I know ACCSP doesn't prefer the term final, but you know, validated landings that you would find through the ACCSP database um, for for example, 2020. Uh, I think generally my understanding is that would be available later than when the compliance reports um, are submitted. You know, so they aren't they aren't arriving at the same time. Um, and so that is a consideration for this board that if, if there is an interest in using uh, landings data from the ACCSP data warehouse, that, you know, that that timetable for when that data would be available to, for example, be looked at or go into a management document. Um, would probably be different than when we, uh, if we were going off of the information compiled just in state compliance reports. Mr. Chair, I'll just, um, Mr. Tony, uh, and I'll just add that, you know, we'll make our best efforts to, you know, work through the ACCSP and the states. In some circumstances, there's some information that the states have that the ACCSP does not have. So in the end, you know, when we're working through allocation management documents, the state has the final sign off on their numbers before we work through them. So in the end, it is, has in the past always been the state's final check to make sure we have the correct data, but we are always working through the state and the ACCSP to validate those numbers. And if the board wants to have a different formalized process, we can definitely work through that as um, the document moves forward. All right. Thank you, Kirby and Tom. So, um, so in terms of what would be available uh, during, well, before and during the spring meeting of this board, We'll, we'll have compliance report data, but we won't necessarily have uh, any um, differences between ACCSP warehouse and state data resolved. So we could have some, some issues there. Uh, if, we, if theoretically we initiated a management action at that spring meeting to, to revise allocations, then we could, uh, I guess, perfect uh the, the document as we move forward uh i guess that's a long way of saying we, we'll be facing delays that could affect our ability to implement changes uh for the 2022 fishing year we'll have to sit down and talk to accsp and the states on that spud to give you a clear answer Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon, for bringing that up. Uh, obviously, when we get into alloc allocation discussions, uh, decimal points matter. Uh, and so we want to make sure that everybody's as confident as they can be in the information we're using. So that, uh, Lynn Fagley. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. I just wanted to start by saying that I really am looking forward to talking about allocation. Um, but in the meantime, I did have one question. I have a question and a comment, um, if I may, a question for Megan. Um, yeah. And, yeah. And, I, and Megan, I really appreciate the, you know, the synopsis of what you guys are dealing with up there. I was curious about um, effort um, in your fisheries, whether whether you have incoming effort to the fishery, to the Menhaden fishery, if people are transitioning over from herring, if you're seeing your, um, you know, more people engaging more vessels. And that's not something that I think you need to answer now, but I would just be sort of curious to see, you know, what the capacity, what your, how your capacity is building um, for Menhaden. Um, and then with that in mind, I, I, I kind of wanted to give the board a little homework because allocation is so challenging and it's so challenging for a fish like Menhaden. You know, Maryland, we are um, a very small player in this fishery, although the fishery is sort of the linchpin of our, of our um, watery communities. And, and we do see that these fish cycle north and south. So about the time that Amendment 2 was put into play in 2013, I think, we were landing, um, you know, in the in the realm of about 13, 11 to 13 million pounds of Menhaden. And we seem to go through these cycles. You can see it through time in our pound net landings that we have these these um, big events and then they 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 go into a lower cycle, which is where we are now. And whenever we're in a low cycle, New England seems to be in a high cycle. So these fish seem to do these th this thing where they flux up and down the coast and whether or not that that fluctuation is going to um, change with climate change, um, you know, who can say, but we get the sense that these fish are probably going to come back because that's the way that's what that's what has happened in history. And with that, I, I need to repeat that, you know, our fishery in Chesapeake Bay is prosecuted by gears that cannot move. They are passive gears. They sit in the water. Um, they cannot chase the fish. They cannot go find the fish. Um, they just are, you know, whatever passes by is what they get. So it, it's a little bit awkward um, to put them on the same playing field as a gear that can really go out and run, chase the fish, find them, and catch them. And so the homework really is for everybody to maybe put their thinking caps on, think creatively, how do we handle allocation in a situation where the fish population does seem to, to slosh back and forth from north to east, and we have these very different sets of gears um, harvesting these animals. And, I, and I'll just wrap that up, Mr. Chair, by saying I really would recommend, I think it's very helpful um to set up when we start down this road i think i think a working group um is helpful as inclusive as we can possibly be just so that we have a little more time to talk in a little more detail um about how we might want to approach this rather than you know around a big table under a parliamentary procedure thank you thank you lynn and it's uh comments like that that make me regret that I didn't become a forester instead of a fisheries biologist because uh, bless their hearts, those trees do stay put until you cut them down generally. So uh, anyway, I appreciate your comments. Uh, Dennis Abbott, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Woodward. Seems like you're a sucker for punishment, though. You retired and here you are back again right in the middle of this cup of whatever it is. So we have no sympathy for you today. <laughs> Uh, let me say a couple, of, I have a couple of comments and a couple of questions. Megan made some very good points about issues that she's experiencing in Maine and that we're experiencing the same things here in New Hampshire. I don't know what would have happened from my viewpoint if the population of Menhaden had it, hadn't drifted northward at the same time where the herring population was collapsing. I think several years ago, 
when the herring quotas were going down, there was a lot of concern that there would not be nearly enough lobster bait. And luckily, Menhaden showed up and sort of filled the breach to some degree. However, I was thinking, well, I've been thinking for the past few days, but I also was, had some thoughts after the first two speakers from the public spoke, Mr. Zelisak and Mr. Lilly. In recent, as recently as last year, we incorporated ERPs. And ERPs, in my opinion, shouldn't, or this would be a question, shouldn't they have a spatial component? You know, it's one thing to say that we should be providing food for all the critters in the water, above the water, and whatever. But if we're taking too many Menhaden out of one localized spot, I don't think that we're doing much when it comes to ecological reference points and managing, you know, in that way. Or does it not make a difference where we take the Menhaden? Does it make a difference if we're catching them in the bay or whether we're catching them in the open ocean? And does the location where we're taking them, does that affect reproduction as, as I understand it, Menhaden are spawning in the open ocean and then they follow a gyre into wherever they go. So what I'm trying to get at is I think that whatever we do moving forward with allocations should have some sort of a spatial component to them. Should we not be looking at dividing the allocations regionally? Are we taking, a number of years ago, we put a cap in Chesapeake Bay and we lowered it and it surely led us down a path of, you know, problems. But is the quota that we're taking out of the bay a right number? Should there, should there not be some sort of, I don't know what words to use, some sort of study to determine which, what would be a good number to be taking out of the bay when it comes to Menhaden. And also final comment would be the folks from Maryland, you know, brought forward an issue and they would like to see us do something about the Chesapeake Bay. And I su I've suggested to them offline that you know, it's a it's a problem that started in Maryland, and you know maybe Maryland should respond to them and you know initiate some action from that direction. But again, I think we have to look at spatially where we're taking Menhaden from. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis, and, and uh, I think maybe one of the elements of uh, if if we do go down the route of of forming a work group to address allocation, and I know work the, the term work group causes some folks some angst, uh, certainly. Uh, that's probably one of the things that they would look at is, you know, is, is there something better than state by state, you know, should be managed by regions. But I, you know, I think when you, when you look at a species like Menhaden, you have to certainly be open-minded about, you know, what do you want to accomplish uh, with with an allocation scheme. So thank you, Dennis. All right, Roy Miller, you're next, and Cherie, you're on deck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a quick question for Megan. Megan, uh, what gear type are we talking about in Maine? And I presume, since we're talking about millions of pounds, it is a directed fishery. Mr. Chair, is Go that ahead, okay? Meg. Okay. Thank you. Um, so yes, it, it is a directed fishery. Um, primarily persings is the gear that uh, is harvesting Menhaden. Um, there are also gillnets. I can get more specific percentages if that's something you'd be interested in. Um, it would just take me a few minutes. Well, Megan, I was most curious about the, the primary gear type, and you say it's mostly persings. Um, Correct. So they're not it's not a bycatch, it is a directed fishery then. Okay, thank you. Yep. And, and Mr. Chair, I'll say I'm happy to answer Ms. Bagley's questions too, but I can do that later in the queue. Um, I have my hand up. 
Uh, well, I'll tell you what, why don't you just go ahead while it's fresh on our mind. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think, uh, Lynn, I actually think there are two questions in your question. The first is, what are the impacts of the herring fishery really having some significant reductions? And then the second is kind of what are effort trends? Um, and I'll just start by saying, you know, we have a pretty high capacity in Maine as it is to harvest Manhattan. Um, we're a big coast and have a pretty big fleet. Um, I do think herring is part of the conversation here. You know, we've had 90% reduction in those quotas over the last few years. So Manhattan has become a critical bait source in Maine. Um, that said, I don't think we're seeing a lot of the what I would consider like primary herring boats um, transfer over to Manhattan because of vessel size restrictions. Um, so I, I don't think that's where like we would see a, a burst in effort coming from. Um, I think actually where we're seeing maybe burgeoning effort is in the small vessel group that I talked about. So, um, and, and this is linked to herring in the sense that it's lobstermen trying to catch their own bait um, and, and men hated is that bait source. Um, We've actually created two separate licenses in Maine for Manhattan to try and tackle this issue of how do we manage really diverse user groups for Manhattan. Um, so we have a commercial and a non-commercial permit now. Um, the non-commercial permit is intended for these um, lobster boats out, uh, that are trying to catch their own bait. And we cap them at a very low trip limit of three barrels per trip, which I think a barrel is about 350 pounds, so a little over a thousand pounds. Um, but the positive there is that they get greater flexibility on the days they can fish. For the commercial license, which again is maybe the larger boats that people think of with Manhattan, um, they will have a higher trip limit, but are pretty restricted on their landing days. And we do see a lot of lobstermen kind of self-select into that lower trip limit to be able to get more landing days because that helps them plan Manhattan days versus lobster days. So hopefully that gives a bit of picture and effort. All right, thank you, Megan. All right, uh, Cherie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just would like to echo more of what Megan has indicated um, on behalf of the state of New Hampshire. We are extremely thankful to all the states that have been willing to uh, give up some quota so that we can continue to uh, provide our lobster industry with bait, considering we really don't have um, herring any longer in our um, in our wheelhouse for our lobster industry. We have been very fortunate to have um, a few big boats that have um, been willing to come into state waters, um, to land, I should say, not to fish, um, and provide this needed bait source as well as when they are um, out fishing for longer days in between landings, we have made adaptations to our rules to allow for smaller sort of per seine, for example, to uh, fish in state waters to still be able to supply uh, smaller amounts. But our lobster uh, pot, footprint in our state waters really prevent any other sort of mobile gear from fishing in our state waters. So we're, we are very reliant upon these bigger boats that are fishing in federal waters and such to land in New Hampshire to help supply um, our major commercial fishing industry. So like Maine, um, we have become very reliant upon the graciousness of other states to transfer some quota up to us. Again, very thankful for that. And I am looking forward to this uh, further discussion in our future. Thank you. Thank you, Sheree. Uh, Tony, do we have anybody else in queue? We have uh, Ms. Meserv and Roy Miller. All right. All right, go ahead, Nicola. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll just jump on and say that I'm, I'm also looking forward to this discussion of the allocations continuing. Um, and I use allocations in the broad sense to also incorporate looking at the um, episodic event set aside percentage um, and the incidental catch and small scale allowance. Both of those measures are really, you know, intimately tied to the state allocations. So in terms of what um, staff could also provide for the next meeting, it would be some additional information on, on you know, which states are using the um, incidental catch and small scale fishery allowance and, and the and the episodic set aside. Um, I think one of, the, one of the benefits of the default allocations in Amendment 3 is that there does seem to be a, a reduced dependence on the small scale allowance um, with a notable exception of, of Maine, I think. Um, and, and so I would like some of that discussion to kind of focus on whether that's still an appropriate tool, a necessary tool. Um, I think it's an area of the plan that, you know, was subject to some criticism in terms of it's, you know, a pool of landings that are not counted against the, the TAC. Um, so I think it's something that, you know, deserves just, you know, discussion as this, to be part of the discussion as, as we move forward talking about the allocations. Um, and I just, I'd point out, you know, in, in Massachusetts, also we've um, appreciate the quota transfers um, and have had a, you know, increased trend of using our quota in the last couple of years. And that's not been due to an increase in, you know, a number of vessels or, or uh, you know, higher fish availability in just the last two years, but some changes in the Massachusetts regulations that have enabled the fleet to, to take more of that quota. So I would anticipate us having, you know, similar high percentages of quota use moving forward uh, since we made some of those regulatory changes. So thank you for the time. Thank you. Uh, all right, Roy Miller. Sorry, I just forgot to lower my hand, Mr. Chairman. Oh, okay. All right, that's fine. Uh, any other hands raised, Tony? Any hands? Can you hear me? But Bob, I think Tony had to step away for a minute. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Any other hands raised? You can see. There don't appear to be any spud. Okay. Very good. Well, that's that's been good. Good conversation. I guess I'll uh, I'll throw something out. Uh, I guess to you, Kirby, and and uh, sort of in response to what we've heard, and it, it sounds like the you know the board could benefit from from maybe. Uh, a better understanding of what's going on in the Gulf of Maine and, and then these New England states. And then maybe something that, that we need to talk about preparing for the next meeting uh, to better understand uh, how things have changed up there. We can see the numbers, but there's always a lot behind the numbers in terms of, of how fisheries are changing and evolving and that kind of thing. So that may, may be useful. So, um, uh, last chance for comments on uh, review of allocations um, before I move into other business. Any hands? Hey, Spud, this is Kirby. Just want to circle back to um, some of the points people brought up of data they want to see moving forward. Thanks. Yeah, so I, I have the note about uh, relinquished quota that John Clark had mentioned, and I've got the note that Nicola mentioned about wanting to have a little bit more information regarding, you know, which states have been uh, landing um, Manhattan under the episodic set aside and, and those that have been claiming incidental catch. Um, but, you know, I think what would be helpful from a staff standpoint, if, if this is information that the board wants to have uh, at their disposal uh, by the, the May meeting, um, you know, I think what, what I would plan to do at this point is I'd be going off of, um, you know, compliance report information, but it would be good to know, and, and the group doesn't have to make a decision at this point, but if there is that interest in having, um, you know, landings data uh, from ACCSP to be used, 
um, you know, that that's definitely something that, that we should should have clear at some point um, so that we can get the ball rolling to make sure we have the uh, a, a data request put in properly. Um, to what Tony had mentioned before, you know, there's this validation process that ACCSP does. We would need to make sure that all states have given the thumbs up for any you know, landings data that goes into a management document that it's validated. But the other thing that can get a little complicated is that, right, ACCSP has this information broken out by gear type, but um, the way that these landings are categorized, as has been talked about, into these different bins of directed reduction, episodic set aside, and incidental catch um, are sometimes made really only clear through the compliance report. So, you know, I, I think there may be this need to have some element of both reports, compliance reports and ACCSP data moving forward, um, but it would be good to know at some point, you know, what the, the board wants to use if there is that interest in doing a more thorough review and of, and of what years in, in, in particular. Thanks. I'll just uh, bring up what I mentioned earlier, and that is if, if we do believe that we need to have um, ACCSP data from, from the warehouse, uh, it could possibly delay us having the information we need at the, at the May meeting for, for discussions. But um, so I guess, I guess that's where I'm sort of hung up on this, is if we commit to, to using ACCSP, data warehouse information, or are we going to hamstring ourselves in terms of, of moving forward? And like you just mentioned, is there going to be uh, sources of information that we don't have? And, and how do we commingle compliance reports and ACCSP data warehouse information to make sure that what we have is the total and complete picture? Um, so um, I don't know is there, if there's any strong feeling from, from the board um, we're kind of we're kind of living curving a little bit of an ambiguous place here, I guess. Um, maybe this is something that that you and I and, and Tony and all can discuss further. Um, but I think the goal is to make sure that what we have available in May is the most complete and trustworthy information that's available. And yeah, thanks, Bud. And you've got uh, Jeff White in terms of staff in the queue. And I think Bob wanted to speak, Kirby. Sorry. Bob, go ahead. No, I didn't have a comment. Okay. All right. Well, Jeff, go ahead, Jeff White. Thank you. I just want to let the board know that the normal timeline for ACCSP consolidating the data and making it available as a validated data set is April 15th. So some of the points that Kirby brought up about dispositions will still be um, on the table, but the normal process and timeline is is April 15th. So they've already begun that uh, for all species. And I just wanted to, it makes the timeline a little tight for your May meeting, um, but that's the goal that we're shooting for, uh, for your awareness. That's it. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, well, I'll just say this: we'll 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 make sure we do our best to, to bring the most complete and trustworthy information back um, to the May meeting for for further discussion. So, um, all right, we're going we're going to move on to other business unless there's anyone um, wants to make a comment about the allocation review. Um, we had a request from Allison to uh, discuss a topic under other business. So, Allison, I'm going to let you have the mic. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to address you all, the board, uh, directly. Um, hopefully, also, you all were listening to Dennis's comments during the allocation discussion just a few minutes ago, because he pretty much laid out everything I wanted to discuss today. So, um, kudos to that, Dennis. Thank you. Um, but basically, what I wanted to just talk about briefly is you know, over the years and as far back as the 2004 Menhaden Workshop Report, the Technical Committee, ERP Work Group, peer reviewers, and others have brought forth many research recommendations to improve our understanding of Menhaden populations and Menhaden dynamics. And, you know, no doubt 
this board, the commission, the technical groups have made significant progress on some of those recommendations, particularly as we all know the ecological reference points. But certain questions like what we've already heard discussed today about forage base in Chesapeake Bay, where are these fish going? How long are they staying there when they get there? Um, those types of questions continue to elude us uh, on a general basis. So what I wanted to discuss today and what I'd like to request uh is possibly tasking the technical committee and the erp work group if necessary with identifying and prioritizing which data or data collection programs would be necessary to develop some more spatial components of the ecological model obviously specifically in our interest within the chesapeake bay i think this is an, an important next step um, that would allow us as board members to review such a report, um, discuss these data gaps, and either go back to our states or possibly collectively try and seek some funding through the commission to support these research priorities to continue advancing our Menhaden models, Menhaden management, and finally get some of these research recommendations off the page and into reality. So I wanted to put that forward under, under biz other business today, Mr. Chair, um, just to uh, have a discussion around this and see if the technical committee could produce um, either a report or a memo for the board, which prioritizes some of their research recommendations to answer these questions. All right, thank you, Allison. I'm going to uh, go pass that to, to Kirby and, and Tony for some feedback. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, so, this might be a little bit of a team effort to try to answer this. So um, I think it might be helpful first to turn to the um, our TC chair, Josh Newhart, if he's available. I think he might be on the line. Um, and if he's not, uh, then the other person I was thinking that could be helpful to try to talk to this spatial uh, element that, that Allison mentioned uh, would be uh, Katie Drew regarding uh, the ERP model. Hey, Kirby, I'm right. Oops, sorry. Go ahead. All Go right. right. Chair, thanks, Kirby. Hi, everybody. I'm Josh Newhart. And uh, yeah, I can speak to it um, a little bit. I'm sure if Katie wants to hop in, then she can hop in terms of ERP, but uh, a lot of what Allison brought up is is currently uh, there are research priorities, you know, based on the last assessment um, to develop one of them long term to develop, you know, a spatially explicit model. Now, of course, it's not uh, Chesapeake Bay specific; it just uh, just says spatially explicit. Um, so that way, once and some data we have, some data we we don't have. Um, I guess it's not necessarily, I don't, I can't necessarily speak, it's been a while, but I don't know if it's laid out exactly um, what we have and what's what's needed. So, you know, in terms of developing a memo, that, that could be possible there. Um, but I will say at least the spatially explicit model um, is on the radar for for both the single species assessment as well as the ERP. It's, on, it's a research priority for that as well. Thank you, Josh. Uh, Katie, if you own, do you want to add anything to that? Um, no, I would just agree with Josh that uh, to emphasize that, you know, this is definitely information we've presented to the board before, and we can certainly pull it together into a, a more comprehensive format. Um, and the spatial component of the ERP model is sort of the next big project we want to take on with the ERP modeling. And so I think it would be reasonable for the TC and the ERP uh, to have maybe a call or a discussion about next steps and a timeline and data availability um, from our own sort of organizational and progress making standpoint. And then we can report back to the board on um, what that timeline is looking like in terms of having a, a spatial um, or a more fine scale model for the ERPs for the next benchmark. Thank you very much. Okay, now, Allison, I think it sounds like we've got uh... So some forward momentum. So we'll uh, we'll look uh, into the future to hear back on this. But thank you for for bringing it up. We certainly want to, uh, you know, it's, it's 
as satisfied as we are to have crossed the threshold on ERPs, it is just the uh, it's not the end of the journey by any means. So it is 3:55. We're scheduled to end at four. Um, is there anything else uh, for the good of the board? Uh, anyone has? Raise your hand. Um, Spud, you had Bob Beal and Lynn Fagley with their hand up from board members, yeah. and then Phil Zaldek also has his hand up from the public. All right. Uh, go ahead, Bob and Lynn, you're on deck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I um, just very briefly wanted to talk about sort of the money side of the of um, Allison's question and I don't we may not want to wait until after all the technical conversations happen to start looking around for some funding to cover some of these priorities I think um, well the executive committee tomorrow morning is going to be reviewing a letter to the office of management and budget that has a number of ASMFC priorities in it for fiscal year 22 um, there's a couple specific projects in that letter, but they're ongoing projects. Um, so we, you know, possibly could add some Menhaden research for the Chesapeake Bay uh, into that letter, or we could just add it to the list of priorities that that Deke and I and and a number of the the board members take to Capitol Hill when we're talking to appropriations staff and trying to get funding that way. So, you know, if this group is comfortable with that, I think you know, we can bring this idea forward to the executive committee tomorrow morning and they can decide what the best route is to try to chase down a few dollars to cover, uh, you know, these research priorities. They are, a number of them are pretty expensive. So uh, we're not gonna be able to cover these with, you know, little bits of money here and there. They're some pretty big chunks of money. So I think, you know, starting that conversation with the appropriations folks, uh, the sooner we sooner we start that, the better. Thank you, Bob. Uh, good, good point. Uh, I know several of us have looked at that letter multiple times, and you think we would have at least uh, recognized that Men Haiti was conspicuously absent. But uh, I, I would imagine that there wouldn't be any opposition from the from the uh, Men Haiti board for a discussion about that tomorrow. So we'll we'll look forward to that. All right, Lynn Fagley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just uh, real quick, and just to piggyback with Allison a little bit, you know, you, the board heard it today. We have stakeholders who are very concerned about, you know, Chesapeake Bay and the unique role that it plays. And I think um, because of the the high dollar on a lot of these projects, that's that's one of the reasons why priorities are going to be really important. And I think it's going to be also important to for the TC, if they can, to help the board understand how some of the listed priorities in the you know, stock assessment and the um, amendments might help elucidate what's happening with dynamics in the Bay. So for example, you know, there's a priority that has to do with a coastwide you know, adult survey. I'm probably not quoting that exactly right, but you know, what happens in the Bay doesn't happen in a vacuum. So I suspect that some of these research priorities might um, take on a little bit more of a coastal, um, they might sound more coastal, but they may really help us understand um, bay dynamics better. So I'm just sort of asking if it's possible to make that link, um, it, would, it would be helpful. And also to help us understand too, I know we've had some memos about it, we should go back and read them, um, where the aerial survey um, that was put together, the aerial survey design that was put together by Dr. Wilberg um, would fall in the priorities. So thank you for the time. Thank you, Lynn. All right, we've got one, one minute. So uh, Phil, I'm going to allow you to, to use that one minute and then we're going to adjourn. So go right ahead. Getting some focus regarding the Chesapeake Bay, but uh, uh, Chairman Spud, I just got a question. Who's the lead on bringing something to the table in May regarding, uh, you know, spatial considerations and specifically the Chesapeake Bay? Given that the Chesapeake reduction cap is mentioned, uh, is stated, I should say, in the uh, current um, uh, fishery management plan. Who, who's the lead to bring that sort of technical view to the table? And also, let me tell you, I thought, well, I talked to, uh, uh, 
Michael Wilberg, and as I recall my last conversation, the estimate was between $250,000 dollars $450,000. We don't seem to ever have money to go ahead and execute his fully vetted and approved uh, uh, approach by the technical committee. So who's the lead on this thing in your mind? Well, we, we as a board depend on the, uh, the technical committee to advise us on, on the scientific needs and priorities. And so I think we've, uh, as you've heard today, they've been tasked to, to come back to us and give us uh, the kind of information we need. And also, as you've heard from, uh, from Bob Hill, you know, we're going to try to get this put on the, you know, uh, on, on the radar screen for funding. So it's, uh, you know, whether there'll be information available to directly affect the allocation discussion, that remains to be seen. Um, uh, you know, we're gonna we're gonna have a robust discussion about allocation, and hopefully produce an outcome that is satisfactory to everybody. But we are in the very uh, infancy of that at this point. So, I appreciate that. All right. Uh, any other uh, business to come before the board? Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? Someone raise their hand. Um. Many people, Melville. Okay, all right, very good. And uh, we'll consider that seconded by acclamation. All right, thanks everybody uh, for your participation in the meeting and uh, have a good rest of the day. And I look forward to our next meeting in May and we'll stand adjourned.